1 Corinthians chapter 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. We saw how the Corinthians assemblies had formed into cliques and petty rivalries and even downright gluttony as they would, you know, eat all the food up before everybody got there to their potlucks before they celebrated the Lord's Supper. And their times of celebrating the Lord's Supper, Supper were certainly not an agape feast as they called them back then, the love feast. There was no love going on. And, and we close with Paul saying to them, you know, I praise you not for this. I mean, you think I praise you for this? No, I'm, I'm glad you're getting together. You should still get together, but how you're doing, it's not good. But like a good pastor does, Paul doesn't beat them over the head with their failures. He re-instructs them on the meaning of the Lord's Supper and how they can change their selfish culture in their gatherings. And on this day where we celebrate the triumphant entry of Jesus into Jerusalem, you know, let's remember why he wrote in. The king of creation came to die for you and me. So remembering our king, chapter 11, verse 23. For I received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, he took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. Paul begins to re-instruct them by explaining what the Lord's Supper means, why we do it. And so he starts off by saying, this is not just my idea. He says, for I have received of the Lord that thing that I handed down to you. I, he, was, he instructed me, and now I'm instructing you. And so, you know, Paul couldn't praise them for how they were gathering because this wasn't just, well, we're going to do our church if it's a little different, or we have a different style of how we do the Lord's Supper. They were ignoring Jesus' clear instructions. And so to remind them of those instructions, Paul goes back to that special supper Jesus had with his disciples where he instituted them. And he says that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and then he instituted it, okay? Now, before we get into that, Paul is doing the pastor's job. You know, this is the pastor's job to hand down what was taught to you faithfully to the people who are in front of you. The pastor's job isn't to come up with new methods or creative ideas. It's but to take it what God said and hand it down to God's people so they can apply it to their lives. You know, frequently, and I know many pastors struggle with this, there are times when I think, Lord, I don't know if we're reaching our community. Or I don't know if we're reaching the people. I don't know if we're making an impact. And so you pray and you pray and you pray. And every time I've done that, over all the years I've served the Lord as a pastor, every time the Lord says to me, well, love my sheep, feed my sheep, teach them my word, you know, serve them, be patient with them, you know, be gracious to them. It's the same every time. And I'm like, Lord, are you sure there's no new idea? And he's like, no, same thing. And it's because that's what our job is. You know, our, I always think, you know, sometimes we have to be very careful about trying to reinvent Christianity. There was a pastor and his wife for a period of time, and I'm sure they love the Lord, and I'm not trying to be critical of them in particular, but they decided they were gonna, they were gonna do a teaching on intimacy and marriage. And so they decided they were gonna videotape, you know, devotional teachings from their bedroom. Not what you think. But they were going to do that, and I thought to myself, you know, that's a little too much information. I don't need to see your bedroom, first of all, and I certainly don't want to know what goes on in it. So there are times, you know, there was a guy that came out riding on a horse at one time. You know, he'd come to his sermons, and he'd come riding on a horse to the pulpit. And you know, maybe that works in Texas, I guess, but you know, I don't think it would be appropriate here. The idea behind it is, is that we have to be very careful because at some point, the, the creativity can take away attention from just the pure power of taught truth, Right? This is the pure power of taught truth. I could be the worst preacher ever, but I get up here and I could speak God's word and God's spirit can take it and bring life to you. Now, it doesn't mean I should attempt to be the worst preacher up here and I certainly attempt otherwise. But it's the power of God's word that changes a life. It's the power of God's word that even if it doesn't emotionally affect a person that builds them up spiritually inside. And so that is the job of a pastor. Or if you teach a Bible study, you know, that's your job to take the things that were passed on to you from scripture and to hand them down faithfully to others in a way that they can apply them. Now, what did Jesus teach them? Well, it says the same night even which he was betrayed, he took bread. Now that, that refers to the Passover feast. He took bread during the Passover feast as they were about to eat the big dinner and he broke it. They would break it and hand it around and people would take pieces off and then they would eat it. He said, take and eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. 
This do in remembrance of me. So Jesus broke with the traditional Passover ceremony at the moment of the supper, and he said words that were not normally said during this time of the Passover feast. And he says he gave thanks first off. Now, the word here, give thanks, is the word eucharistio, which is where the Orthodox Church, the Catholic Church, Anglican Church, Presbyterian Church, Lutheran churches, where they use, they get that, that's how they use the name Eucharist for celebrating communion. So if you've heard it before, that's why, where that name comes from. Now, the early church used the word Eucharistio to refer to the entire love feast, from the potluck, to the time of fellowship with one another, to the time of remembrance, to the Bible study, and then to the time of of singing songs to the Lord. Uh, we do our order a little bit differently. That's not what's important here. The idea was that it was all a giving of thanks. It was all to be a time of giving of thanks. Later on in history, the church dropped the potluck and the fellowship portion so that all remained, all that remained was the ritual of remembrance, the bread and the cup. Now, when only a ritual remains, you must give a reason to do it. And so later on, the church said, well, you can't have access to God's grace and therefore salvation unless you perform the ritual, which came to be known as Holy Communion. I'm really leery of calling it communion because I know what it represents and what I'm about to describe to you is not what we believe. I use the word communion at times because even though I don't like it coming out of my mouth, I realize most people don't think of it that way. And, you know, otherwise you have to come up with real creative phrases, you know. And so most of the time I get up here and say, hey, we're going to celebrate the Lord's Supper today. And some people get confused. Are we having a potluck, you know? And, and I understand why that's confusing. So there is no real good way to say it. So I use that word sometimes. But that's where it came to be known as Holy Communion. Now, to infuse it with the power to grant salvation, to give you his grace, it became a supernatural ritual where the officiating priest changed the bread into the physical body of Jesus so that he could be killed again for the sins you committed since the last time you took communion. This is called transubstantiation. And it placed salvation in the hands of the church. Because if only the priests are the ones who have the supernatural ability to turn the bread and the, and the wine into the literal body and blood of Jesus so that you can receive grace, if you don't take it from them, then you don't get forgiveness. So now the church was the one who dispensed salvation. And so the, the church actually taught at that time that Christ's cross, his death on the cross, only paid for Adam's sin, which doomed mankind. Your sin had to be pay, has to be paid for over and over and over again every time you take communion. And so that's why you might be asked, you know, when's the last time you took communion? Because the idea is, is this is how much sin you have to get taken care of during that time. Now, you say, why are you bringing this all up, Will? I bring it up because I want to make clear we do not believe this. We do not believe this. When we celebrate the Lord's Supper, when we hold the bread and we have the cup there in our hands, this is not what we're doing, okay? Okay. And I need to make that clear because I understand that times have changed and we don't live in times where we suffer persecution because we don't believe this. There are times where Christians lost their lives at the hand of the church because they refused to believe this, because they refused to recant their belief in this. They were burned at the stake or they were thrown from buildings. They were killed for their faith, believing that Christ and Christ alone saves. So I will not candy coat it and I will not be politically correct about it. We do not believe this. And why don't we believe that? Well, turn to Hebrews chapter 9 with me. Hebrews chapter 9. Beginning in verse 24. It says, for Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands. In other words, that the temple that existed in that day, which are the figures or symbols of the true. They are a picture of the real temple that's in heaven. But he entered into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Nor yet that he should offer himself, how many times? Often. As the high priest, or like the high priest would enter into the holy place every year with the blood of others, the high priest would go in every year on the day of atonement to atone for the sins of the nation. Jesus doesn't do it every year to atone for our sins. He entered in once, and it explains why. For then, if that was the case, he would have had to suffer since the foundation of the world, because how would have everybody got their sins forgiven prior to the cross? But now, 
Once in the end of the world has he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And as, or just like it is appointed to man once to die, but after that, the judgment. So Christ was how many times offered? Once offered to bear the sins of many. And unto them that look for him shall I appear the second time without sin unto salvation. Look at chapter 10 in Hebrews verse 11. Verse 11 of chapter 10 says, And every priest standing daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices. These priests, they would offer. You know, if, if you were, you know, let's say your name was Bob and, you know, and, and you would be walking up and you'd have your little, you know, lammy beside you and, 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 and you'd go up to the high priest and, and, and he'd greet you there at the, at the door to the tabernacle or the temple and, and he'd say, Bob, what's going on? He said, well... You know me and my temper problem, or you know me and my, you know, I, I, I got get mad, you know, mad at the neighbor and moved the boundary again, you know? And, and, and he said, Bob, Bob, this is like the third time this week. You're going to run out of animals, you know? And, and he, every time he'd have to do this, every time he sinned. So he says, every piece, that's how they did it back then. Which those things could never take away sins. That's why they had to be keep doing over and over again. But this man, this man, Jesus, after he had offered how many sacrifices? One sacrifice for how long? Forever. He sat down on the right hand of God. From henceforth, from that point forward, he doesn't die anymore, but he's expecting or waiting till his enemies be made his footstool. For by one offering, he has perfected forever them that are sanctified. Whereof the Holy Ghost also is a witness to us, for after that he had said before. In other words, this isn't new ideology. This was taught in the Old Testament. And what did he say in the Old Testament? that this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law into their hearts, into their minds will I write them, and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more, amen, right? Now, where no forgiveness, where no remission of these is, in other words, where no, if it's all forgiven, then there's no more offering for sin. There's no need to re-crucify Jesus over and over and over again for the sins you committed this week because you, you, know, you, you haven't taken communion again. This is a false teaching that we do not believe. So what do we believe? Well, first we have to look at, back in 1 Corinthians 11, what does it mean when Jesus says, this is my body? And that seems pretty straightforward, Will. If he didn't mean it is his, is, if he meant it isn't his body, why did he say this is my body? Well, let me tell you what it can't mean for sure. It can't mean theologically what we've just described, but it also can't mean that it still is his literal body and blood because God forbade that. He forbade eating human flesh and he forbade drinking human blood, drinking any blood, really. The early church confirmed the Old Testament law. You can write it down in your notes in Acts 15, 19 through 20. As the Gentiles started getting saved, they said, you know, these guys are getting saved. How much of the law of Moses do they need to keep? Like what's a moral law that still applies across the board? And they said, well, four things. And guess what one of them was? Don't drink blood. You, it's almost like back then the Lord spoke to him and said, by the way, my church eventually is gonna think it's okay to drink blood. Please remind them it's not okay. It's not okay, <laughs> okay? So only poor teaching, poor understanding of the scriptures would contradict both Old Testament law and New Testament church teaching, okay? So what does it mean when he says, this is my body? While the word is there means to exist as normally, it can also mean to represent. And context is of utmost importance. From what we have in other scriptures, which mean Jesus can't be crucified again. We're not allowed to eat people, all right? We're not gonna be having, you know, roast will tonight. Well, maybe you might have it this afternoon as you talk about my sermon, but we're not gonna have roast will tonight at the potluck, you know, and we're not gonna be drinking blood. So if it can't mean that, then the only alternative is that it means to represent. The word is here can mean to represent and context determines that it must. So this bread represents my body. When you put all these things together, Jesus is showing us that the bread represents his body to help us remember, which is the main command here. The main thought here isn't this is my body. The main thought is the command here in the verb, do this in remembrance of me. So what are we to remember? Well, it's his body. This, ble this bread reminds us that Jesus took on flesh, that he became a man. You know, his love for us caused him to invade time and space in order to take on a human body. 
Maybe you're here today and you think, ah, all sorts of mythologies have that gods becoming men. Yeah, but that's usually so they can sleep with women or defeat armies or do all sorts of other crazy things. You know, when you read mythologies, what do these gods do when they become men? They'd be more than men. They have exploits and they exploit the people that, they, that, they, that worship them. But what did Jesus do? <laughs> the Bible says there was nothing about him that would make him stand out from anyone else. There was nothing about him, no form of comeliness. Like, you know, we always portray Jesus as like an attractive guy in movies. As my daughter asked me the other night, she said, Daddy, she goes, you know, the Bible says that, you know, we, we're not supposed to make images of God, right? And I said, yeah. She goes, why do I have a picture Bible with pictures of Jesus in it? And I'm like, man, she's good. <laughs> I said, let's go burn it, honey. I said, well, I said, I don't think people are trying to make pictures of Jesus to worship. I said, and that's the main idea behind it. I think they're just trying to depict something so you can understand it a little better. I said, my Bible doesn't have pictures and my Bible's a King James version, so it's the only inspired one anyway, right? (laughs) You know, Jesus didn't come looking all handsome and whatever. The Bible says there was no form of comeliness that would make him stick out. He wasn't like Saul who was head and shoulders above everybody else. He was like David, you know? Nothing special about him, you know, not from an outward appearance. He, he didn't have a special birth. He was literally born in a barn. He, he grew up in Nazareth, Beantown, where one of his own disciples said, can anything good come out of Nazareth? And then his advanced men, those who proclaimed that he had come, they weren't exactly the most reputable people of the time. In the early 1900s, they said, you know, don't, uh, men, don't let your daughters date baseball players, politicians, and Navy men. Sorry, Navy guys. That was back then. You're much more upstanding now. They said, don't do that. And, and, you know, back then it was, don't let your daughter date a shepherd because they were the men of ill repute. They're the guys who are going to announce Jesus. And he lived a life. He was a handyman. You know, he was a town handyman guy. And if you're a handyman guy, that's great. But in that culture, it was not exactly a high honorable position. There was nothing unique about Jesus that made him stand out and go, oh yeah, he's God. In fact, that was the problem they had with him. They're like, you're Jesus. I mean, we know your brothers. We know your mother. We know your father. We know your sisters. I changed your diaper. They couldn't get over how normal he was. Can't be God. But his love took him to that place. You know, there are probably numerous times and you can kind of almost sense it when he would go, oh, wicked generation, where you kind of just figure that there's probably something inside of him that goes, can I just show him for a second, you know? And then everybody would be like, whoa, repent, you know? Actually, they wouldn't. That's why he didn't, right? Out of his love for us, he says, lo, I come. In the volume of the book, it is written of me, dad. A body you have prepared for me. I'm all in. I'll do it. And he lived a life among us. And that body eventually was broken. Now, Jesus' bones were not broken, so his body wasn't broken in that sense. The word actually broken here means to be disjointed. And that's exactly what the Bible prophesied would happen to him. In Psalm 22, Jesus, David speaking, but Jesus speaking through David, describes crucifixion. You could turn there if you like, but I'm going to just read some verses real quick. If you're taking notes, it's Psalm 22, verses 12 through 18. Jesus says, I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. This was prophesied before crucifixion was invented by the Persians. I mean, Jesus is experiencing what is prophesied here by David over a thousand years later. All my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax that is melted in the midst of my bowels. My strength is dried up like a potsherd and my tongue cleaves to my jaws and you have brought me unto the dust of death. For dogs have surrounded me. The assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. When you're on a cross, you're hanging there and they've got the, they, they didn't break his bones to do it. They put it between the two arm bones and then of course you have the two leg bones. They didn't put it into the foot actually. In fact, in most Roman crucifixions, they just tied the feet. So the fact that Jesus' feet were pierced is unique in and of itself. And they put it there between the two bones and the leg. 
And then you would have to, with your tippy toes, that's how hard it was because you're nailed there. It's almost impossible to push up. You would be completely, every bone out of joint and you would just push up a little bit in excruciating pain against the nail and take a breath because you'd be suffocating. It would compress you know, your, your breathing apparatus. And, and as a result, you'd have to push up and work real hard just to take a breath. And then you'd go right back down again and begin to suffocate some more. Crucifixion was something that normally took place over days. Jesus, because of the feast, they came to break his legs and the prisoner's legs, but of course he had already died because no bones of him would be broken. But his body was disjointed and it was disjointed, the Bible says, for who? For you, for me. Jesus' love for us, he was broken for you and me. He was disjointed, the cross, for you and me. Jesus' love is proven by his death on the cross as well as the incarnation. But God demonstrated his love towards us, Romans 5, 8. And while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, right? God will seek to prove his love to you in no other place but the cross. So God, if you love me, you get me this promotion at work. Well, he won't prove to you he loves you because of that. He might give you the promotion just because he's good. But he'll prove his love to you in one place, and that's the cross. And the purpose of this, he says, this do in, not in remembrance of me, but into remembrance of me. The word in there means to take something from the outside and bring it to the inside. This is the purpose of celebrating the bread and the juice. It's so easy to become familiar with the cross. You know, we can sing songs about the cross all the time and we smile when we sing it. I mean, really, we smile when we sing it. Now there's a reason why, it's because of forgiveness. But I think if we change the name to at the electric chair, the electric chair, you know, we might not smile as much. Or at the firing squad, the firing squad. That's what it was, the place of execution, the place of death. And it brings it into our hearts again. It takes it from that familiar thing on the outside and it brings the significance of Jesus' love right there close to my heart. To remember it, he did it all for us. You know how this truth needs to re-enter our hearts regularly. It's why we celebrate communion once a month. It's important. Now, what does the cup signify? Well, it says, after the same manner also, or in the same way. Now, it wasn't immediately after he took the bread. In fact, there's a delay between the bread and the cup. They broke the bread, passed it around, and then they ate the supper. And then the cup came out. Now, actually, in the Passover, Jewish Passover feast, uh, there were four cups. And it says here, now, after the same manner, in the same manner, just like with the bread, he interrupted the ceremony. And it tells us when he interrupted it this time, when he had supped. So after they'd eaten the, the food. So during the Passover feast, the Jewish people would drink four cups of wine. The first was a cup of sanctification, which symbolized God's promise to rescue Israel from their burdens under the Egyptians. And this was drunk at the start of the feast. The second one was the cup of judgment. And this would occur after they would do their ritual bathings and washings. And then they would explain the story of the Passover. The father would ask some questions of his kids or they would ask questions to him and then he would give the answers and tell the Passover story. And then they would drink this second cup and it would symbolize God's promise to deliver Israel from their slavery by judging the Egyptians. Then they would eat the Passover feast. They would drink and they would have the supper time and they would eat the Passover lamb. The Passover lamb would be roasting on the spit. And remember, it was a different spit. It was a, a cross beam spit. It, remember, I showed you pictures last year at our Good Friday service of, of, of the spits. In Israel, they still have them today where you see them, these cross beam spits where the, the lamb is basically looking like he's being crucified on these spits. They still do it today. And yet a veil's over their eyes. So they would eat the Passover lamb and the rest of the meal, and then they would drink the third cup. This would be the cup of redemption. It symbolized God's promise to free Israel from Egypt miraculously. And after that cup, they would sing Psalm 136, and then they would drink the final cup of restoration. It symbolized their great joy because God had made them his people again, and they had a relationship with him again. And the feast would conclude with a round of more praise for all God had done for them. Now, as Jesus is presiding over the feast with his disciples, that Passover lamb is roasting on the spit. And then as they're about to begin eating, he breaks the bread and he shares that with them and this new thing. And then they eat the feast. They eat the Passover lamb. And then after they're done eating, Jesus takes up the third cup and now he breaks with the traditional ceremony yet again. 
And he says that this cup, he says, is the New Testament in my blood. This do you as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so the cup that represented the lamb whose blood was shed and the Passover, now he says it's going to refer to him. So now the cup represents the testament of his blood. It doesn't represent his blood. It represents the new testament uh, in his blood, and, and which means by virtue of his blood sacrifice. So it, the new covenant is what the cup represents, not his blood. It represents the new covenant that's made possible by his blood. You know, we don't say that, you know, that, well, okay, the, the, we have the bread here and it turns into the literal body of Jesus and now we have the cup and it turns into the literal new covenant, you know? We don't say that. But that, if we're going to take it literally, like some are asking us to in, in the doctrine of transubstantiation, that's how you would have to take it. But that's not what it says, which is why we don't take it that way. So by virtue of his sacrifice, this cup now symbolizes the new agreement, the new covenant that we have in him. The covenant here is an agreement between two parties with the offer as the one who guarantees its fulfillment. And aren't you glad that Jesus is the one who guarantees the fulfillment of this covenant, <laughs> not you? Aren't you glad that it's not based on 100% faithfulness on your part? Hmm. This cup represented God's covenant with Israel in the past. But Jesus says, it all pointed forward to me and from now on you will look back to me when you drink it. Now it will represent my new covenant with you. My new covenant with you. And the purpose is the same. This do it as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. So the same purpose for the bread. To bring it from my intellectual awareness to a keen heart reminder that brings a renewed gratefulness in my heart. The true meaning of Eucharistio. Because in doing so, when I remember that and I have a thankful attitude and I hold those things in my hands together with my brothers and sisters, we as individuals and together are declaring anew our faith which saved us. Verse 26. For as often as you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. The word there show, that's a, a really mild word, but it means to announce, to proclaim with conviction, to preach, to declare. This is the same word used in Exodus 13, 8, where God is instructing his people, how to, his, the dads, to preach the story of the Passover to their kids. When we hold that cup and we hold that bread, you are a living sermon to everyone around you. See, like baptism, our celebration of the Lord's Supper is a public declaration of our faith in Christ, that we've rebelled against our God and we deserve his judgment, but that our, and that our hope isn't in our good deeds to make up for it or in any other God to save us from this judgment, but that we've put our trust in Jesus and his sacrifice alone for our rescue, Amen. Every time you do that, that's what we declare. We are preaching it every time we do it. Now, having explained the nuts and bolts of the Lord's Supper to them again, doctrinally, Paul explains how that applies to their improper celebration of it. Verse 27, wherefore, in light of this teaching I've given to you, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. And that's been a scary verse to a lot of Christians down throughout history. I don't want to eat unworthily, you know. Me and my wife got in an argument this morning. I'm not taking it today. I'd be unworthy. First off, unworthy simply means in an improper manner. Unworthy is a little bit strong. We're going to see a lot of strong translation here, at least in the old King James, because the people who translated it, they believed in the other doctrine about this that we don't believe in, and you had to make sure that people towed the line. So they had to use some heavy language here to make sure people understood that. That's not what these words mean, though. Unworthily simply means in an improper manner. If you eat this bread or drink this cup of the Lord, now this is where it's no longer the Passover feast anymore, but now it becomes the Lord's Supper, a different feast that the church celebrated. If you do it in an improper manner, he says that person shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. You might be saying, well, that sounds equally as bad. The word guilty there means to be liable for and deserving of the penalty of the body and the blood of the Lord. Yes, it does sound bad, but what does it mean? Well, Paul will explain more what to eat it in an improper manner or unworthily means in verse 29. Here he simply lists the horror that we are guilty of something when we do so. What are we guilty of? Well, what you're guilty of is 
sin. The same thing that put Jesus on the cross. That's what he's saying here. He's saying here, he says, if you drink this in an unworthy manner, you're doing the things that put him on the cross. It's sin. If you do this in an, an improper way, you are in sin. That's all he's saying here. Now, what about this unworthily thing? Let me tell you what it doesn't mean. It doesn't mean that we must make ourselves worthy to participate in the Lord's Supper. Or if we've had a bad week, we should abstain or a bad morning. Because the truth is, you and I can never make ourselves worthy of what Jesus did. In fact, the Bible tells us we're to walk worthy of our calling. We're not to try to be worthy of our calling. We're to live our lives as such that the word worthy means of equal weight. That's what it means. It was actually a, a financial term because they would weigh out things back then. And if it was worthy, it was when everything balanced out. We're to walk worthy. Our lives should balance what Jesus did for us. So if all the love that he showed to us on the cross, our lives should live, magnify that in such a way. Say, I love Jesus back for all the love he has for me. I want my life to reflect that. That's what that means. But I can never be worthy of his love. I can never, how, how do you, I mean, the very nature of the word love implies there's nothing of worth. It's unconditional, right? So there's no worth involved in it. He just loves us. So you'll never be worthy of what Jesus did. And the truth is, if anyone needs to be reminded of and to take heart in the work of Jesus on the cross, it's the person who's blown it, amen? That's, what, that's the one who needs it. So the, our time of communion is the perfect time for someone who's had a rough week to make things right with the Lord, which is the right way to take communion. Verse 28. But in contrast to doing it improperly, I know we haven't gotten to what that means yet, but in contrast to doing it improperly, but... Let a man examine himself and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. That phrase there is in the imperative, which means it's a command. But a man, if you're going to take communion, a man must examine himself. What does examine mean? It means to test for genuineness and sincerity. You know, the word for sincere in the Bible, a different word, but it, it means like translucent. And what it was, it was a pottery term. And, and what they would do is when they were trying to determine if you were trying to pull, pull the wool over their eyes, you would take the pottery and hold it up to the sun. Now, if it was translucent, it meant it was sin. It was bad. It was no good. You know, it meant, it, but if it was sincere, it meant it was, you used the real stuff and he wasn't trying to pull one over on you. So the idea of examining here is to test for genuineness and sincerity. Now, when we gather for the Lord's Supper and we celebrate it, you are to allow the Lord and say, say Lord, examine my heart. I want to know where areas I'm not being sincere and not being genuine in my faith. Areas where I need to get my heart right with you. Now, if you pull out the spiritual electron microscope to use in your heart, your heart will find plenty of things to toss up there to condemn. The Bible says, that, thank God, if our hearts condemn us, God is greater than our heart, you know, because he knows all things. Remember the context here. The Corinthians were eating all the food, right, before anybody got there, not leaving anything for the latecomers, and not even the latecomers, just the people that didn't get there on time. And remember, they were separating into these cliques of, and being selfish. Do you think any of that would be going on if they'd simply obeyed the command to ask the Lord to examine their hearts? No, none of it would have been going on, you know? Certainly not. And, you know, while we have a moment here, I said it in the first service and I'll say it again. You know, my leaders come to me every once in a while and they inform me, they say, you know, Will, when you pray, when you're praying, there's certain people who exit and go back to that table so they can get the food before it runs out. Guys, let's not do that. You know, every time I, they tell me that, I say, well, let's just get rid of the food. And I'm like, no, there'll be a riot. <laughs> and, and what I realize is, is that's not fair to the people who love showing hospitality. Do you realize there are people who serve all throughout our kids' ministry wing that never get a thing because you guys are stuffing your face? That's not what it's here for. If you're using this as breakfast, please eat at home or there's an IHOP right across the street. Okay? We do this just to have a nice time to fellowship so you take the edge off a little bit so you don't have to feel like you got rushed and go get lunch right away or whatever it might be. So you can just take the edge off and hang out a little bit longer. And there are folks here who are tremendous cooks and they just like to bake things to bless the body of Christ. You know, Paul will tell the Corinthians, he said, are you hungry? Eat at home. And I say the same thing to you guys. I try to say it graciously. If you're hungry, eat at home. Wow, it got quiet. 
But this is the idea for us. When we take the Lord's Supper, this is the perfect time to take our bad week to the Lord and to receive his forgiveness and his help as we seek to obey him going forward. He says, once you've examined yourself, then go ahead and eat. So let him eat, he says, you know? This is the way that, that, that you, you should eat. You know, Paul wants the Corinthians to participate. He wants them to take the bread and to take the cup. He wants them to do it, though, with the right attitude so they can be rid of the selfish uh, mess that they've made of this special celebration. Now, verse 29, here's the consequences of doing it the wrong way. And in it, Paul explains to us what it means to do it in the wrong way. He says, for he that eats and drinks unworthily eats and drinks damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. The word damnation there, again, remember I told you they had to keep people in line with their theology so they'd use some really harsh words. That is a bad translation. The word simply means to be evaluated by a judge. Last I checked at the Olympics, or maybe in some places at competitions, but most Olympic competitions or foreign competitions, you know, if the judges find you lacking, they just give you low scores. They don't send you to hell. You know, I haven't seen, you know, Simon on, you know, America's Got Talent, and not that I watch the show, you know, sending people to hell because they don't sing well. He might want to because he's pretty mean, but you're a rough crowd today. <laughs> Say, no, Pastor Will, you start messing with our food and that and the other thing. I had a pastor who used to say, you know, oh, people, the pastor's done gone from, from preaching to meddling, you know. What does the word mean? It means to be evaluated by a judge. It, it's the idea of, uh, of being examined. In other words, if you're going to eat, uh, eat and drink in an improper manner, you're eating and drinking an examination to yourself. God's, if you won't examine yourself, God will examine you and he will have to discipline you. He will have to do something about the fact that you're not sincere and you're not walking in obedience to him. He'll have to discipline you. You know, why? Because that's what this time is for, to examine yourself. And when you don't do that, it says you're not discerning the Lord's body. So to eat in an unworthy manner means to not discern the Lord's body. What does that mean? The word to not discern means to fail to make a difference between two things. Well, what two things? Well, the Lord's body and any other type of get together. In other words, I can discern the difference between spam and steak. And my approach to both of them are very different. Eating steak is a holy rite right? You don't do it very often. It's a special occasion, most of us. And, and when you do so, you know, it's usually you're going to dress up to go to a nice place. You're going to have the steak or have a special time where you're going to barbecue and cook out, you know, invite the family over. You know, we don't do that for spam. At least anytime I have done it, no one comes. In other words, if you're going to go through the motions of the ritual, but forgo the examination part and treat it like any other religious thing that's done by people, then God's going to have to evaluate you and deal with your wrong behavior accordingly. If you want a scripture reference, read Hebrews 12, five through 11, because we're running out of time. But in Hebrews 12, five through 11, it talks about how God disciplines his kids. That's how you know you're his. He spanks his kids. And he does so because he wants to correct our behavior not send us to hell. You know, I don't walk into my child's room after I've said, go sit down in your bed. You know, you've disobeyed mommy. We need to talk. I don't go in there and I'll come to him and say, you know what's coming, right? And they go, yes, the ground is going to open up and swallow me right into the pit of damnation. And they don't say, daddy, you're going to spank me because you're mad at me. I say, daddy, you, you know, you're going to discipline me. And I say, yeah, and I'll discipline him, you know? And then we talk. I say, you know why daddy disciplined you? Most of the time when they're pouting still, no. <laughs> but they know because they don't. They say, Daddy, discipline you because I don't want you to live this way. You know, hey, mom, you asked mommy for something and she said, no, we're gonna have dinner soon. You can't have the icicle. And, and then you threw yourself on the ground and had a fit. You know, I don't want you to grow up someday and go to your job and you say, I'd like a raise. And they say, no, you just got one. And you throw yourself on the ground and have a fit. And we laugh about it, but people do these things. They never learned. You can't act that way. And so I don't want you to grow up that way. I don't you grow up to be a good young man, a good young woman. And even more importantly, someday I won't be here. And I don't want God to have to discipline you to get your attention. I want you to honor him because you love him 
and you want to please him. That's why God does that for us, to correct our behavior. So the idea here is Paul saying, if these Corinthians will continue celebrating this feast this way, well, then it's going to incur God's discipline, not for their destruction, but so they'll repent. In fact, God's discipline had already fallen on some of the Corinthians for their carnal approach to the celebration. Verse 30, for this cause, many are weak and sickly among you. You know, he says, listen, because you've been celebrating improperly, the Lord has already got, some of you are sick because of it. And some of you, he's even taken home before the time. You say, does the Lord take a person home if they persist in their disobedience? Yes, yes. There are times he does. You can see it in the Bible. Saul is one of those guys. You know, the Lord, he came to him and said, Saul, he said, you know, what you did here was wrong. You know, because of this, you're not gonna, your family's, the kingdom's not gonna stay in your family. I'm gonna give it to somebody else. Saul's like, oh, Samuel, please, I wanna get it right. You know, please, let's, you know, can you go up and do the offering with me? Samuel goes and does it. Okay, and Saul thinks, good, I escaped that one. But then he does something wrong again. And so the Lord says to him, you know what? Now I'm gonna take the kingdom from you. And it's going to go to somebody else who has a heart after me. And so you know what, Saul? When God raises up that man after his own heart, instead of abdicating, what does Saul try to do? He tries to hold on to the kingdom. And so what does the Lord have to do? And then he and also tries to kill the guy God's raising up. And what is God's only choice at that moment? He says, Saul, this day you'll be, <laughs> you'll be with me because I can't let you keep doing this. My people are suffering. The people around you are suffering because of it. I'm taking you home. Look at all through the scriptures. You see it time and time again. I've known many a saint who who got saved and then they backslid and they just decided to live their life however they wanted to. And then they got some horrible disease and they come back to the Lord at the end, at the the 11th hour. And you know, when you talk to them, they say, no, I lost my marriage. I I wrecked my, my relationship with my kids. I wrecked my career because of my sin. And I say, well, the Lord forgives you. It's okay. But that's the end of their life. There is a story that ends that way. And for some of the Corinthians, it had ended that way already. How do you avoid that? Well, it's easy. Verse 31. For if we would do like Jonah, just run, right? No, don't run. Verse 31. For if we would evaluate, judge ourselves... We should not be evaluated. We, we, if we'll ju- evaluate ourselves and we get that opportunity every time we take the Lord's Supper, you can do it all the time and you should do it all the time, but the Lord's Supper is a reminder to do it. If we do it then, we won't be evaluated by the Lord. But even when we are judged, even when the Lord does evaluate us and discipline us, does he send us to hell? Is that what it says in verse 32? No, it says we are chastened of the Lord. Why? so that we won't be condemned with the world. And that word condemned does refer to eternal judgment. See, God disciplines us. He brings consequences for the purpose of improving our behavior so that we won't be condemned with the world. See, if God didn't correct us and bring consequences, it would put us in danger of an even greater consequence of persisting in our disobedience to the point of leaving the face someday. And I know you probably know people who've done that. And the Lord does not want that for you. He wants you to repent. He wants you to come back, even if it's at the 11th hour. And so to spare them these dangers, Paul has a final word of correction. Wherefore, verse 33, my brethren, when you come together to eat, wait for each other to get there. (laughs) Simple. Wait for each other to get there. Celebrate it together. But you know what's interesting about this word, Terry? It actually means more than just to wait for somebody. The word actually means to await, await for everyone to get there. You say, what's the difference? Well, it means the same thing. Wait, await, it's just a different way. You know, one sounds older. No, actually, they mean something different. See, to await means to not just wait for someone to get there, but it means to look forward to everyone getting there. And that's how our church services are supposed to be. You know, are you looking forward to tonight? Or you're thinking to yourself, I need to make sure I get there right at five o'clock when we start eating because if I don't, that crazy guy named, you know, Polanski or whatever, he's going to come and he's going to try to, you know, talk to me. And you know how it is when you get in a conversation with Polanski, he just talks to you off forever. And I don't want to spend the whole night talking to Polanski because I really need to talk to Sue. In other words, don't form cliques. 
Don't only associate with those that are easy to get along with. Or don't just share, you know, uh, the, uh, hang out with people that share something other than your faith that's in common with you. We have so much variety in just this service. And then we have a whole other variety in the other service too. And when we get together, you're not gonna all of a sudden just click with everybody. But we all have one thing in common, our faith in the Lord Jesus and our reception of his love for us. And so whether you're one of the crazies or one of the non-crazies, it's okay. God's put us all together in the same pot, you know, and the ingredient that keeps us together is his love. And Paul says, if any of you are hungry, let him eat at IHOP. Then you come not to, that you come not together unto condemnation. That's what it says. That's what mine says. <laughs> and again, condemnation there is the word to be disciplined. And that's not the, the other condemnation. And then the rest, he says, I will set in order when I come. In other words, there's a lot of other small issues Paul needed to correct, but he'd deal with them in person because there's another big issue that concerns their services, their worship services that he needed to talk about. And it was their use of spiritual gifts, which we'll get to in two weeks. So read chapter 12 for, not next Sunday, because we're gonna have our Easter celebration service. And, uh, but then the week after that, we'll come back to 1 Corinthians chapter 12 as we get to that interesting chapter on, well, chapter is 12 through 14 on spiritual gifts. So anyway. As the worship team comes forward, I would ask you, you know, do you look forward to seeing your brothers and sisters whenever we gather? Or do you get annoyed at the prospect of having to deal with them? You know, the latter attitude of being annoyed comes from your flesh, but the right attitude comes from the heart of Jesus because he looked forward to being with his disciples when they were together. You think of Jesus and his disciples. I mean, really think about it. <laughs> this, this, this is interesting. Who's the one guy who called himself the disciple that Jesus loved? John, John the beloved, right? You know, there are times when I wonder if the beloved was kind of a, uh, uh, words gone from my mind. Uh, what does it mean when you're being oh, sarcastic? It was our, John the beloved. We all love John, you know? He's the guy who every time he gets somewhere first, he points it out, you know? Son of thunder. That was the nickname Jesus gave to him. John's the guy who came to Jesus and he said, you know, master, we went into this town over here and we said, Jesus is coming. And you know what they said? We're busy. We don't want him. So Lord, we know you are a busy man too, just like these people are. So just give us permission and we'll call fire down on heaven and wipe them out. <laughs> Me and James have talked about it. We've planned it all out. It happens all the time. People come to me and say, pastor, we've planned it all out. And you hear it, you're just like, what in the world? And what does Jesus say? It's one of those few glimpses where he goes, what have I to do with thee, thou son of energies? You know, sons of thunder, you know? What do I have to do with thee? What, what, what would make you think I'd be on board with that plan? <laughs> I love you guys. <laughs> and yet Jesus, what does he say? I mean, about John, what does he say? His whole experience of Jesus was, I'm the one he liked. I'm the one he loved. We don't even have to go into Peter and anybody else. Just go right to Judas. You know, Judas, who he treated with such love and such compassion, even though he knew he was stealing, knew he'd betray him, knew that he wouldn't repent. And yet it says he loved them all to the very end. Jesus looked forward to being with his disciples when they were together. So if you need more of the heart of Jesus this morning, then my, my loving encouragement to you is repent. It's a beautiful word. Turn around. Let him fill you with his love. You say, I don't know if I can, I, can, I, can, I can have love for that person. You're right, you can't. But Jesus can fill you with his love for that person because it's not hard for him. What does that love look like? How do you know if you're not loving towards somebody? Well, read 1 Corinthians 13 and every time you see the word love, put your name inside. Will is patient, will is kind and then go down the list. And anywhere you see that that's not you, then you gotta pray and say, Lord, toward this person, I'm not like you here. Because if you put his name in there, he is that. God is love. He is patient. He is kind. He is all those things. So you say, Lord, you are this. Will you supernaturally fill me with your love so I can be like you to these people or to this person? I promise you, if you ask him, he'll help you. And maybe you're here this morning and, and you say, well, that's nice for you, Will, but you know, I have a different approach to God. 
You know, I, you know, I, I don't have the bread and the juice thing, but I do other things that, you know, uh, to, to make God happy with me and to make him pleased with me, you know, to make up for the wrongs I've done. Well, can I ask you a question? If you were to put that into the context of any other relationship you have, do you think that would work? You know, hi, honey. You know, I know that I, I look at pornography all the time, but my hope is, is that I will be nice to you like the day after I do it and that will make up for it so I can still do it. That doesn't work with people. Why do you think it would work with God? Oh, you say, well, God's different. He's good. People aren't. People are different than him. You're right. He is different than people. And that's why sin is an even bigger deal to Kim. He made you. He's worthy of your whole life. And that makes every wrong thing you've ever done even weightier to Kim because he deserves perfection. He deserves all your love. And because he is a good God, he has to right every wrong that's done, which means punishing wrongdoers. I might be saying, well, that's, that's bad news. And you're right, it is bad news. But the good news is this, that that same God who's good and must punish sin loves you and doesn't want to punish you. And so he stepped into our world by becoming a man. And almost 2,000 years ago, he rode into Jerusalem on a donkey. 2,000 years ago today, he rode into Jerusalem on a donkey. The king of creation came in peace to make peace between us and him by dying on the cross for our sins. And to appropriate that offering, you must turn away from your own way of making things right with God and place your trust in Jesus and his sacrifice for your sin. You know, it'll be very easy to walk away this morning as if it's just another church service. But don't make that mistake because just as one can eat unworthily, one can attend unworthily. Make your being here today count for eternity. Turn to the one who loves you and give your life to him forever. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for your word, which is life-giving. It teaches us of your love, Lord, but it also teaches us of our sin, that there was a cost, Lord, to bring us back into right relationship with you, to buy us from our slavery. Just as much as Israel was in Egypt, was a slave, we had to be bought back from the slavery of sin. And we thank you for taking our place on the cross. Lord, we want to examine ourselves regularly like we ought, Lord. Like David said, search me, O God. You know, know my thoughts, see my heart, see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in your way everlasting. Lord, help that to be our hearts every time we celebrate your death and we remember it. And Lord, all throughout our lives. With every eye closed, every head bowed, if you're here this morning and, and, and you've been trying to make yourself righteous before God on your own, or maybe you've just been living however you want and you wanna get right with God today, you want to, you want to come, come to the Lord or come back to him. You know, I'd love to pray with you. So if you'd like to do that today, just lift your hand up high where I can see it because I'd love to pray with you before we close this morning. If you want to make today count and just say, I want, to, I want this day to be the first day of the rest of my life and my relationship with Jesus. I believe he died for my sins and I want, I want to be forgiven. Anybody this morning before we close, just lift your hand high so I can see it. Oh Lord, we love you and we thank you for the cross. And we worship you now in Jesus' name, amen.